By now, several small aircraft carriers had begun operating across the Atlantic, and their martlets and avengers were not only long-range eyes for the convoy escorts, but were also highly effective weapons in their own right. Despite all the improvements in convoy defence, the U-boat arm continued to go from strength to strength. After the second happy time, morale was the highest it had ever been. There had also been a series of logistical improvements. Special supply submarines called milch cows had been used on the American operations. These large submarines resupplied the U-boats in mid-ocean, enabling the U-boats to remain on station for even longer. There had also been important technical advances. Many U-boats were re-equipped with new and deadly acoustic torpedoes that homed in on merchant ship propellers. Metox radar detectors were now fitted as standard and alerted the crew when they had been discovered by a convoy escort, giving them enough time to dive and escape. By the autumn of 1942, Allied air coverage along the Atlantic convoy routes had been considerably increased. But in the north, where the bulk of British imports crossed, a large air gap still remained, known to Allied sailors as the Black Pit. It was close to this air gap that Dönitz concentrated his U-boats, 30 in American waters and 40 in the western approaches, including several strong wolf packs. In early November 1942, SC-107, sailing from New York with 42 ships, was attacked in the largest convoy battle of the year. In just four days, 15 Allied merchant vessels were sunk, and altogether, the U-boats destroyed more than 80,000 tons. In the last six months of 1942, throughout the Atlantic and Caribbean, the U-boats had sunk a massive 575 Allied merchant ships. If the Germans could maintain this rate of destruction, the British war effort would collapse. The building of new merchant ships had fallen behind schedule. But most dangerous of all, Britain had just three months' supply of fuel oil left. For the Allies, the Battle of the Atlantic had reached a crisis point. Allied commanders knew that it was their failure to sink large numbers of submarines that lay behind their constant reverses. They had made a concerted effort to destroy U-boats by bombing their yards and bases. But the U-boat bases had been equipped with huge reinforced concrete bunkers, or pens. The pens were completely impervious to even the largest bombs. At sea, in 1942, the Allies had sunk 87 U-boats, higher than the year before, but averaging less than eight a month. The Germans had built three for every one lost. And during the year, the number of operational submarines had risen from 91 to 212. For Admiral Dönitz, although 1942 had ended on a high note, he was not totally confident. Dönitz feared Allied technical improvements. He had learned of the powerful searchlights fitted to maritime aircraft and was beginning to suspect the existence of the new Allied 10 centimeter radar. To form wolf packs and intercept the convoys, U-boats needed their full range and their full speed. Therefore, they had to stay surfaced as long as possible. Dönitz knew that if the Allied countermeasures could keep the U-boats from traveling on the surface, then the wolf pack would be defeated. To prevent this, the U-boats were fitted with more powerful anti-aircraft guns and ordered to fight it out instead of diving. And once again, U-boat radio codes were changed, maintaining the intelligence advantage for the Germans. 
In early 1943, unexpectedly fierce storms once more swept through the Atlantic, reducing submarine activity, and for a short time, the convoys went unmolested. It would be spring before the weather lifted and the offensive could be resumed. In March, Dönitz sent all his available U-boats into the ocean and stationed them in the very heart of the mid-Atlantic air gap. As the U-boats pounced, they proved again and again that Allied air cover was still inadequate. Convoys were as vulnerable as ever. U-boats tore into a string of merchant ships, achieving some rapid and spectacular victories. Then, just a few days into the renewed offensive, German codebreakers informed Admiral Dönitz of the course and position of two convoys carrying vital war materials bound from the United States. This gave the Admiral time to set up the largest and most devastating wolf pack ambush of the entire battle. German intelligence indicated that two eastbound convoys had left New York, SC-122, and the faster HX-229. On March the 12th, Dönitz deployed the biggest concentration of submarines ever. 38 U-boats in three wolf packs, coded Raubgraf, Stürmer, and Dränger. The slower convoy passed through the 600-mile-long Raubgraf unnoticed, and HX-229 outran it. But in the early hours of the 16th, a submarine from Raubgraf returning home with engine trouble steamed right into the midst of the unfortunate 229. The U-boat radioed the convoy's course back to headquarters, and immediately, Every single U-boat in the three wolf packs was ordered to converge and intercept. The resulting onslaught lasted for four days and stretched over 600 miles of ocean. The U-boat sank 21 ships, which had 141,000 tons, made it the most destructive convoy battle of the entire war. The crippling loss inflicted on HX-229 and SC-122 was the low point of a terrible month for the Allies. In the first three weeks of March, 97 merchant ships were sunk, half a million tons destroyed, nearly twice as much as the Allies could build in the same time. All Germany's hopes in the U-boats had been justified. Although Dönitz and his crews sensed triumph, the latest successes of the U-boats were not evidence of an imminent German victory. These successes, however dramatic, were due to a sudden combination of unusual circumstances. In fact, although neither side yet knew it, the Allies had already turned the tide of battle. By March the 21st, 1943, merchant ship losses had become so great that several senior British commanders believed the convoy system defeated and that Allied leaders should start trying to find an alternative defence. But the commander-in-chief of the Western Approaches, Admiral Max Horton, was confident that the U-boat successes over the last few weeks would not continue. For a time, the German code changes had blinded the Allies, but the new U-boat cipher had taken only 10 days to break. From now on, the majority of convoys could once again simply be rerouted around known wolf pack positions. What was more, increased air support, particularly with the very long-range liberators, finally sealed the mid-Atlantic air gap. Good intelligence, power...